Hello. I guess you can hear me well. Okay, that sounds good. So I'll be talking about a stack, um, mostly about the rewrite that we had for 2.0, but first a small introduction, who am I? I'm Silvano Cerza, I'm senior software engineer at DeepSet, and as you can guess, I work on a stack. I used to work also on other cool companies like Arduino and Peach before, and I come from this small town in the center of Italy, and now I just moved to the southern uh, of Italy in this beautiful place. So let's talk about the talk. This is a brief agenda. We'll be talking about, uh, I'll give you an introduction to Aztec so you know what we're talking about. Then we'll go through the reasons for a rewrite and what to do after you decide whether to rewrite or not. I mean, in this case, we're just touching the, uh, the, the, the yes. And then we go a bit more into detail on the actual work that we've done in Aztec and then we have just some QA. So. What is Aztec? So Aztec is just a plain uh, open source Python framework that you can use to build your own NLP pipelines. We've been around since a while. You could build, uh, uh, when it started, it was just a, a framework to build a question answering and document retrieval pipelines. The usual NLP stuff, I mean, before LLMs became huge, then we added that to, to the framework too. And it, will, it obviously evolved over time, and that's one of the reasons why we also took uh, the, the challenge of our right. How it came to be true. Uh, so let's go to a bit of history, of timeline. So it started out with another framework that's actually called uh, FARM, and that stands for Framework for Adapting Representation Models. It was born in, uh, the first comet was actually in July 2019, and it, uh, it was a, um, a framework to train language models. Not the big ones like we, we have right now, but the smaller ones. Uh, actually, DeepSet was one of the, was the first company to, birth, to train a BERT model in German. So we got that. And in November of the same year, ASTAC was born, first commit, and it was depending on farm. So it was tightly coupled with it. And it influenced the, its API quite a bit. Then after a while, some month, some years, in September 2021, uh, farm was removed as dependency, so we had more freedom. There was more uh, possibility to do different st things. I mean, the farm uh, nomea still stand in the package name of Aztec. It's actually called farm dash Aztec, and everything was fine. Uh, Aztec was doing its its thing: document retrieval, QA, users were happy. And at a certain point, as I guess everyone knows, uh, a small little thing called ChatGPT came out and yeah, all that break loose. And people wanted to build new stuff. Uh, pipelines were getting more advanced. Uh, there were new use cases. So we added the functionality for LLMs to query ChatGPT and other models. And at a certain point, we realized that probably there was some work to do we had some hard times adding this, this functionality to Aztec. So the topic of our rewrite came about and then we started talking. And there are some pros and cons to consider when deciding on a rewrite. There is the, uh, some of the, of the cons is that it takes a part of the team and you split the team on different projects basically. You need to decide who works on what and there is some context switching too. It's, it gets hard. Another thing is that I mean, we're engineers, we like to write code, but it might not break, it might make, less, make sense uh, on a business perspective. I mean, that, that's just it. In the end, that, that, the, the, the thing is to consider business too. I mean, if, if, if you're not an, just open source project. In this case, there's also some, uh, some pros to it. You can completely change the paradigm of your software. It's our right, so you can do anything. And you can add even the, you can change it so much that it gives you the chance to add new features that previously you couldn't do it. And you can also tackle technical debt. Everyone in a, in a easier way. You can always do that, but out of right makes it easier, I guess. But in the end, it always comes down to two things: time and money. So you need to to decide on that. So after a while, we made the decision. And I guess, I guess from the name of the talk, you can guess what we decided. And yeah, we decided to write and we started to do it. So I tried to here make a nice list of 
some things to consider when actually starting a red ride. And the first thing is to focus on the pain points. If you're rewriting your software, probably there's something wrong with it. That could be anything really. It could be that it's hard to create new new features because there's so much technical depth that makes it hard to do it. So uh, maybe your users want a feature that you can do, and that's a problem. And also, m maybe it's hard to contribute to your project. If it's an open source project, you want ideally to attract as much contributors as possible. If it's if the code is hard to understand, that's that's a problem. So you can focus on that too. Another thing is to listen to your community. That could be even clients, whatever. In this case, it's 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 an open source project, so probably you have an open source community to listen to. They they might have something that uh, you didn't take to, into consideration. Interview them, understand what they want, how they would like to see the project evolve, or even anything. I mean, just listen to your community, really. Uh, or you also risk releasing a ride that doesn't gather to your user. And at that point, you just wasted your time, really. Another thing is consider new use cases. That's still connected to the, to the ones before, right? What you couldn't do before, what you could do, what, in which direction can the, the project go that couldn't before? Could you maybe scrap all the old features that don't make any sense, but you still are around because you, you couldn't implement new new ones for technical reasons, technical depth? That's that's the thing that you can do when making a rewrite. Another thing is, this is important. Set a deadline. Otherwise, you just keep you just strive for perfection and you risk releasing never, or you just fade into into nothing as nothingness and people just start working on new project and waiting and waiting for your right and somebody took you over and then you're dead in the water when you release uh, your new right sorry also <clears throat> don't be scared really to set a deadline that's important because if you're not meeting a deadline at a certain point you can also decide let's scrap this uh, this feature or some part of the of the right, so you can you uh, you can focus on mo the things that are most important. That's also a good exercise to do, and um, and that's it really for the deadline. And also another thing is side of your your path. This could be a life lesson really. Uh, <laughs> but if you have a project that you're writing, probably. People are, hopefully, I guess, <laughs> people are using your existing project. So you need to decide what to do with that. Do you scrap it completely? Do you want to maintain it for the years to come? Do you want to just say, look, we're not doing anything with it for the future. We just maintain it for a couple of months and call it a day. You also need to create some kind of ways for the users to migrate to the new software. Otherwise, it just creates uncertainty, and your user won't like it. Uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll tell you. And what else? Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, a write doesn't involve just code. There's a ton of stuff that you need to take into consideration. Probably you have a uh, documentation that you need to care about. Releasing just the code doesn't make any sense. The user would be lost, and they will have to scour through the code, hopefully hoping that it's well written to understand how it, how it works and what to do. If you have a website, you need know, to, to sync with other teams to update that website. Uh, marketing, there's a ton of stuff. Examples, tutorials. There is a DevRel team maybe that need to go around to conferences and talk about the, the, new, the new version. This is something that you need to keep in mind, really. It's really important. Never find reaching the release day and realizing that there's nothing uh, other than code to release. So what we've done actually for 2.0, I just talk about the main stuff, don't have much time. So there's a ton of more stuff that I'm going to talk about. And the main thing in my opinion is the pipeline. The idea of a pipeline in 1.0 was just like this. It was basically a tube, you get a query, and you get out uh, some some documents or an answer, but it was pretty straightforward. It was basically a tube. You had some decision making in the in some nodes components, but it wasn't really that advanced. Every component got 
the output from the one before and that's how you got the the output in the end from your pipeline and also the components were pretty bulky you couldn't do much uh, it's also it, it didn't give you give you users the chance to do more advanced stuff so for 2.0 we completely changed that now the pipeline is a graph uh cyclic directed graph so you can have decisions you can have multiple inputs you can have multiple outputs you can go back in your in, in a previous nodes in your graph if if you need to correct some errors or whatever this could be useful for example for agents or agentic like behaviors um another thing that is that you might have noticed is i made the the nodes a bit smaller and that's not just for a reason for for spacing reasons. It's actually because components are smaller. We completely changed the, the way that we define the components. Previously, they were pretty bulky and they used to receive, because of the way the pipeline was built in the, to start with, they received basically a ton of inputs and even unrelated data that they didn't uh, need. For example, we have a whisper component that just uh, um, gets audio input and, re and returns some uh, transcription of that audio, but it still gets labels list of documents, paths, but in this case makes sense, but ton of, ton of data that might not be necessary. And there also, and this also pushed the, the devs to create uh, bulky components. You're receiving, uh, you, you, you try to do as much as possible with the data you have. That makes also harder to test components and also for users to create their own custom ones. For 2.0, we made them extremely small. They're, they, they must do one thing and do it pretty well. That's also why they receive the minimum input they need. You can, uh, you can, for example, in the whisper component that I just talked about, it just receives whatever it needs, that list of files or byte stream or whatever. And this is just some example of the differences between, this is the uh, same component from uh, um, stack one and stack two, left and right. And as you can see in the in a stack one, we receive uh, the query, the documents, some meta. I mean, meta might make sense, but not always. And and then you just return the output. Also, uh, uh, the the output wasn't really the best way uh, to define that. And um, this is for 2.0 instead. As you can see, we just get the sources. We just need a, a list of something to convert to. It can be a string that points to a path, a path, a byte stream, whatever. You just get the data's input and you return the documents. And also you can see that uh, we now uh, can uh, define much easier the way, um, the type of the output of a component. Previously, it wasn't that easy. And this was an extremely great improvement because the components are now are much easier to test. The user can create their own custom component like that, really a couple of minutes and you have a component. And this is, I mean, in my opinion, the best improvement. Another thing that we improved from is the one was uh, this mess. This is not really messy because I'm not good at making drawings. It's messy because it was messy. We had uh, the core uh, of ASTAC was uh, had quite some dependencies. The, the fixed ones, and there were a ton of extra dependencies that you could combine together. There were extra, they were depending on other extras, on other extras, and that caused conflicts. That caused mm, the installation time to be extremely long if you depended on multiple uh, extras, because the determination of the version to use could also fail sometimes. And that was a big problem, and also it made it hard to test. We couldn't test this. Uh, really, the matrix uh, would be huge. To, would take days just to, ta to test to test all the combinations. So we went a completely different way, and we split them. Basically, now we have two different repositories. We have HStack Core and HStack Integrations. HStack Core still, I mean, it still needs certain dependencies, but we we scrap the extras. Uh, we don't want them at all because we we we're a bit scared of jumping into the same. Uh, uh, issue that we had before. We still kept the lazy uh, um, a way to install some extra stuff with lazy imports. Basically, when you try to import uh, to use or instantiate a component that actually needs an extra dependency, we check if we if you have that installed and we fail with um, uh, 
nice message telling, I mean, it's, it's a still a failure, but at least you get an instruction telling you, look, you need to install this and this, and then it will work. This is also beneficial because the ASTEC integrations now we have, and basically it's a completely rep separate repository. Each depend, it's extra, it's basically in its integration, it's on uh, its own project. You can, it's a, it has its own dependency, basically, all dependency, all, all integration depend on ASTAC core. That's why also we have lazy imports for, cause for, for let's say marketing reasons, we keep uh, some, uh, at, it's it's mostly for newcomers to the project. Uh, we keep like um, OpenAI and uh, um, Hacking Face uh, uh, components directly into the core cause people want to get started with those usually. So. The Hugging Phase, for example, depends on Hugging Phase and uh, Transformers, etc. But the Quadrant integration that integrates with the Quadrant Document Store doesn't make any sense to have that installed. So we hide that uh, under the Lazy Imports. And this made, made the testing time much faster. It was extremely easier to, uh, to test the, new, the, the core and now also the the integrations. We know right away when a certain integration breaks, we saw I think the number of integration went up four times. To, I mean, we have ton of integration now. Uh, just to name a few, we have Quadrant, Elasticsearch, uh, Weave8, Pinecon, I mean, ton of stuff. And uh, we're still not testing the old matrix source that takes ton of time, but uh, at least the user can install just what they want and what they need. And that's that makes it really easy for the user and also for us, uh, for the contributors and the engineers that work on the project. This made it easy also for the our Dev DevRel team. We have a DevRel team that handles the partnership with other companies, et cetera. And creating an integration now, it's much easier uh, to create partnership, et cetera, because we can just say to a certain company, look, uh, you're supposed to do it like this. If you want to manage uh, your own dependency, uh, your own integration, create your own repos following this, this template or just add it to our uh, repository and we'll manage that. And that was a great improvement. And also just to show that other right doesn't really uh, improve just the life of your user, but can improve the life of your everything basically. Marketing, DevRel, documentation. Actually this made it a, a bit harder to handle documentation because we have to split repositories now, but it's still good enough. We're in the process of moving to a nice way of uh, handling dependencies. And that's it really, that's just, uh, I would tell you to just try it out. That's just install pip install, uh, uh, just pip install stack AI and you're ready to go. You can just go to our website that I'll be linking right after this slide. And um, we'll find, you'll have, you'll find a ton of tutorials, uh, examples, ton of stuff. The documentation is great, it's easy to understand. We're really proud of that. So just go and start using it because that's really fun. I mean, I might be biased, but it's it's a good framework. And also, uh, if you want to learn more about Haystack, we have another talk about it. It's in room A1 on Wednesday at 11.40 and Bill Gay will give it. She's, our DevRel uh, she's part of our DevRel team, as you can see. And we also meet up coming up on Thursday at 6 p.m. at the Mindspace Krause and Strasse. You need to register for that. So if you want to come, let us know. And that's it really. Uh, it's a bunch of links. The meetup is still in the center. Uh, the top one, green one, top points to our website, Discord community, where you can find most of the team. I mean, really all the team. And this is just my Mastodon and LinkedIn. I mean, you can find also me around and ask things and on GitHub or whatever. I mean, Silvano Cherza, it's, it's me. You can find me. I, I'm pretty, I, I have a pretty unique name, luckily. Uh, I have a Twitter account, but it's just there to prevent squatting. Don't, don't follow me there. And that's it, really. Uh, still have plenty of time. Uh, so, time for questions. I, I was faster than expected. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Silvano. And yeah, we have some questions. You are right. Uh, do you have any insights, any information? How many projects using Highstack already migrated to version two? 
Mm, we have some. Well, I mean, we have some metrics in the project, but I mean, it's if people don't disable them, we don't really know much about it. I mean, the we actually released 2.0 on Ma in March, so still recent. There, there's still there's more and more people using it. We can tell. Uh, even in Discord, we get ton of questions about it. We see more example uh, of people building them, and there's also actually uh, there was in. The Intel Labs folks actually created a, a fast track uh, project that's based on Astec one, and I, I I think they're migrating to Astec two, so that's that too. So, so as I continue for previous question, uh, w what's your plan for how long you think this transition will be? So for how long you plan to support version number one? Uh, we plan to release to support it at least for some months probably if at least at, uh, by the end of the year it's still going to be supported but also we I mean we have a migration uh, guide for users that's really easy to follow we have a mapping between the old components and new ones the, the, the previous way to do stuff etc so guys we are safe we have time until the end of the yeah year. yeah I mean that's time but the, the two is much better. I mean, I would use that. Okay. Could you tell us about some decisions you made to distinguish high stack from newer frameworks, such LangChain or Llama Index? Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the first that comes to mind is the, the graph idea. Uh, I noticed that Lang, uh, LangChain now has LangGraph. I mean, uh, but that started out after Haystack 2.0. So I'm not sure who came up with the idea, but it also makes sense. Uh, but it differentiates mostly by the fact that we're much more modular than other com that other uh, um, framework, which we're more comparable, in my opinion, to Lama Index than LangChain. I mean, editing a chain is not easy. I guess some people here try to use LangChain and it's 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 not that easy as creating a new component in Haystack, in my opinion. I might be biased again. Okay, I see. A few questions about integrations. First one, why did you choose to have all high stack integration in one monorepo? Because uh, most of the integrations really are just Python projects. Uh, and they follow usually the same structure. So it's easier to test them in a unified manner. We can have a list uh, right there. We can track the issues in an easier way. But mostly because also, also to keep it separate from uh, the core. Because the ASA core are also more, uh, more, more workflows and in the CI, etc. Oh no, sorry. No, it just went dark. But yeah, that's that's the main reason. So yeah, I also think uh, separating the core from the plugins is was a really high and good step forward. But the question was about why all the plugins are within don't have a separate repository for. Oh, for that, uh, I mean, it's just try to manage ton of the different repositories. It's it's a mess. Even already having two two separate ones, quite hard. Because I mean, sometimes user open the the issue for an integration in the main repository instead of the other one, and vice versa. I mean, it's it's not really uh, easy to manage. Also, I I actually had experience doing that, and it was a mess really. Uh, when I was there, you know, we had different cores for different boards, and we had a, a different uh, uh, a different repo for each core. And for example, tracking an issue for that affected all of them was was hard, and also managing them, CI, etc. Okay, and one more question from the user perspective, I would say, from the users. Um, High stack has a lot of dependency, even for first version. Mm -hmm. So here's the question: Is the situation a changed now? In yes. A, and yes. if yes, can we can, can you give us um, some insights? In um, yeah, just trying to install. J just try this. pp install farm high stack. That's the first ver the first version, and then on a separate rep, uh, separate virtual env, try to install uh, a stack AI. And you see the speed difference quite easily because it takes mm, a minute or two, I think, to install a stack uh, one and 
less than a minute to, insta to install ASTEC 2. Also, the lazy import helps, and the fact that uh, we're not install or installing PyTorch transformers. We're still installing some stuff like that's quite heavy, like Pandas, because we need it for we always need it. But it's it also made it easier to for the user to understand what to install. Uh, for example, if they just need to uh, use Quadrant, they just use Quadrant. If they need VV8, they install that. Previously, it was it was more messy, in my opinion. So now it's more lightweight. More it's more lightweight. Faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's faster and lightweight. That's that's indeed true. I mean, that's that's the point why we decided to to split the dependencies too, not just to make li uh, our life easier, but to make it easier for everyone. Okay, good. And maybe the last question is uh, how you support the users on this migration process? Do you build some tools or it's mostly documentation? Uh, right now it's mostly documentation. We have plan for a tool to migrate, but there's also really hard because there's sometimes it's not a one-on-one -on -one mapping. Uh, the, I mean, migrating uh, the, the ASTAC one pipelines were pretty easy, were just a line. It, there was really almost no decisions in the in the pipeline so that's that's an option that we can make uh and we actually want to build it just a matter of time and not as of now not our most uh, top priority really we have tons of stuff uh, that needs to be done uh for example we're working on evaluation right now because uh the deadline thing was a, a real a real thing uh that we have to set and at a certain point we realized we couldn't shit, uh, ship um uh, proper evaluation with 2.0, uh, so we decided, okay, let's move to that to 2.1. So we're going to release in that probably next weeks. But that that's one of the reasons. Okay, thank you, Luciano, for your presentation.